This is immigration attorney William Kovach. Could Donald Trump be planning a major executive action in an attempt to restrict birthright citizenship in the United States? Stay tuned and we'll talk about it. My name is William Kovach and I am a trained immigration lawyer. I've often been disappointed in the way immigration issues are talked about in the media, although it's not always their fault. Immigration law can be a very complex subject, touching upon constitutional issues as well as personal political points of view. My goal is to explain immigration law to you, concentrating on looking at judicial opinions and executive actions in order to explain how immigration law can have an impact on our community and on our country. I hope that you'll join me as we try to make sense of immigration law and how it may affect the average person. As of the time of this recording, President Donald Trump has finally permitted the Government Services Administration, or the GSA, to recognize Joe Biden as the president-elect, thus beginning the transition to the Biden administration. But that doesn't mean that Trump has necessarily given up his fight to try to maintain power. Nor does it mean that during this lame duck portion of the Trump presidency that the president won't take drastic action to complicate the ability of Joe Biden to begin implementing his agenda once Biden takes office. In particular, with one of the major areas of disagreement between Joe Biden and Donald Trump being immigration, there is nothing stopping Donald Trump from taking major policy action during these last two months of his presidency. We have every reason to believe that Trump is perfectly capable of taking bad faith actions during these two months in order to complicate the ability of Joe Biden to undo all of the immigration policies that Biden and the Democrats find repugnant. In fact, it has been reported in publications such as The Hill and Business Insider that Donald Trump is planning to sign an executive order restricting birthright citizenship. What is birthright citizenship? Well, by virtue of the 14th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, every person who is born within the territory of the United States is automatically a citizen of the United States, with very few exceptions. The most notable exception being children of diplomats or foreign ministers which is an ancient practice from customary international law going back centuries. Critics of birthright citizenship point out that it creates the possibility of so-called anchor babies. Anchor babies are those babies born to undocumented aliens, which may give those aliens a hook to try to argue that they should remain in the United States. Birthright citizenship also allows for an odd practice known as birth tourism. There is a thriving industry, for example, of rich foreigners, such as Russian oligarchs, arranging for their pregnant wives to come on an extended holiday to the United States and to give birth here. The child would then be a U.S. citizen, and this could allow the parents eventually to apply to live in the United States legally. Now, Donald Trump has voiced his opposition to birthright citizenship promising to change the practice as early as when he first started running for president in 2015. Back around 2018, there was a lot of talk of Trump signing an executive order in order to end the practice of birthright citizenship. But this talk ended when there was pushback on whether the president has the authority to change birthright citizenship by acting unilaterally, that is, acting alone based solely on his authority under the Constitution. And there are two main reasons for this pushback. First, Article I of the Constitution clearly gives Congress the authority to regulate nationality. So by the clear terms of the Constitution, the President can't do anything to change the law of citizenship. That is a power that is reserved for the legislature, for Congress. Second. Birthright citizenship is unambiguously enshrined in the opening clause of the 14th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. The very first sentence of the 14th Amendment reads, All persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof 
are citizens of the United States and the states wherein they reside. If it's there, in plain English, in the Constitution, then how can the President change it? Well, according to conservatives, the hook is that phrase, and subject to the jurisdiction thereof. The argument being that if a person is not in the country legally, then that person is not subject to the jurisdiction of the United States, and therefore the 14th Amendment does not apply. Now, there is widespread reporting that such an executive order would most assuredly spark litigation, litigation that could go to the Supreme Court. And it is often reported that we don't yet have a Supreme Court decision that interprets this particular provision of the Constitution. Except, well, we do. It's a Supreme Court case called the United States versus Wong Kim Ark. It dates back to 1898, when the Chinese Exclusion Acts were in force. These were acts of Congress prohibiting Chinese citizens from coming to the United States and becoming U.S. citizens. Now, as an aside, the United States has a very shameful history when it comes to immigrants from China and other Asian countries. During the 19th century, U.S. countries were more than happy to import Chinese labor to work on the expanding railroads. The Chinese laborers were often assigned the most difficult and the most dangerous work, including blasting tunnels through mountains. In fact, the dangerous nature of this work is enshrined in the saying, not a Chinaman's chance. But since the Chinese look very different from people of European descent, and because there are stark cultural differences, Chinese people were feared by Americans. Well into our history, the Chinese and other Asians were not given equal footing in the United States. That only began to change fairly recently. And even today, President Trump exploits ignorant and xenophobic attitudes that far too many Americans have towards Asians, as he attempts to avoid responsibility for the COVID-19 crisis in America by blaming the crisis on China. But I digress. Well, let's get back to talking about Wang Kinemark. He was born in San Francisco to parents of Chinese descent. They were subjects of the Emperor of China, but resided in San Francisco when Wang was born. Wang briefly visited China and returned to the United States without incident. He went back to visit China again, but this time, when he returned to the United States, the customs official denied him entry, citing the Chinese Exclusion Acts. Wang claimed that because he was born in San Francisco, by virtue of the 14th Amendment, he was a U.S. citizen, and therefore the Chinese Exclusion Acts did not apply to him. Six justices of the U.S. Supreme Court, during a time of great xenophobia against China, said to Wang, You are correct. The court noted that the Constitution made various references to citizens of the United States and even to natural-born citizens when it talked about the qualifications to become president. But the Constitution did not itself define citizen or natural-born citizen. To define these terms, the Supreme Court looked to the common law of Great Britain at the time of the adoption of the U.S. Constitution. Under British common law, dating back hundreds of years before the adoption of the Constitution, a person was subject to the British Crown when that person was born in Britain, with two major exceptions. The first being that children of diplomats and foreign ministers were not subjects of the British Crown, even if they were born in Great Britain. The second were children of aliens who were born in Great Britain in territories occupied by a hostile foreign power, such as during an invasion. In fact, the Supreme Court quoted a treatise by Lord Chief Justice James Alexander Cockburn on the issue of nationality. In the British system, the Lord Chief Justice is the head of the British judiciary. And Cockburn reported that even children born to parents who were temporarily sojourning through Britain were subject of the British Crown and thus British citizens. Sojourning being a fancy word for traveling. And for the Supreme Court, this was confirmed by the status of customary international law that existed at the time of the adoption of the Constitution. Birthright citizenship was an international rule, at least until the time of Napoleon. 
the Napoleonic Code changed the basis of citizenship in France to be based on parentage. But since that change happened after the adoption of the U.S. Constitution, it had no bearing on the interpretation of U.S. law. Now, Congress could, and indeed it had, extended citizenship to children born outside the territorial limit of the United States, but two U.S. citizen parents provided that the U.S. citizen father had resided in the United States at some point. But the court noted that even if a child born outside the United States could be a natural born citizen of the United States, the United States could not break the exclusive sovereignty of a nation that it had over its own territory, meaning that a U.S. citizen born abroad could still be subject to the jurisdiction of the sovereign in whose territory he or she was born. And all of these rules, and in particular the exceptions, make perfect sense when you think of the definition of the word subject. In a legal sense, a subject is a person under the dominion or legal control of a sovereign. Diplomats are not subjects, as under customary international law, they remain under the dominion of their home country. In fact, even when they are on foreign soil performing duties, diplomats and foreign ministers are protected under diplomatic immunity. They cannot be prosecuted in the host country for violating the host country's laws. Similarly, a hostile foreign occupier is not a subject of the sovereign whose lands they occupy. In fact, it's quite the opposite. They are attempting to usurp the legal authority of the sovereign and claim dominion over the territory for their own sovereign. The Supreme Court went on to consider various state court cases that recognized the U.S. citizenship of children born to U.S. parents who resided in a foreign country at the time of the child's birth. And so the Supreme Court said, very unequivocally, that even though under the law at the time, the Chinese Exclusion Acts, a Chinese person could not naturalize and become a U.S. citizen, a person born in the United States to Chinese citizens residing in the United States was a citizen by virtue of the 14th Amendment. Now, when you look back at the specific language used by the Supreme Court with 21st century eyes, the language appears to be a little bit troubling. Specifically, the court said that the 14th Amendment covers all children born of resident aliens except for diplomats and ministers and hostile foreign occupiers. Having read the opinion, the first thing that jumped out at me was how this term, resident aliens, seemed to come out of nowhere. There was no discussion in the opinion of a need to be a resident in order to give birth to a U.S. citizen. In fact, as I stated before, Lord Cockburn mentioned temporary sojourners, which is just a fancy way of saying travelers. The injection of the concept of a resident alien seemed to follow from the court's discussion of how U.S. citizens who resided abroad could nonetheless give birth to a U.S. citizen. But the use of the term resident in the Wong Kim Ark case needs to be considered in light of the technology and practices that existed in 1898. Back then, if you visited a foreign country, it was rarely for a brief vacation or a weekend getaway. We didn't have airplanes. Trains had just come into existence maybe a few decades before. So if you visited a foreign country, typically you would reside there for a significant period of time. Now, one could be tempted to equate the term resident aliens with the modern concept of a lawful permanent resident. But the concept of a lawful permanent resident under U.S. immigration law did not exist in 1898. In fact, there was no overall national standard on naturalization until 1906. Oddly, Congress left it up to local courts, including state courts, to determine when a person could be naturalized, with the specific exclusion of Chinese and other Asians. The concept of a permanent resident being a legal status for an alien that existed before becoming a naturalized citizen 
did not exist in immigration law until the Immigration Act of 1924. So the term resident alien, as used by the Supreme Court in the 1898 decision, cannot be equated with the concept of a lawful permanent resident, which only became an immigration status later in 1924. Which means that under Wong Kim Ark, the children born in the United States, even two undocumented aliens, are still citizens. Generally speaking, undocumented aliens come to the United States with the intention of staying here for some indefinite period of time. And so, if the parents do not go through the proper legal immigration channels, that does not affect the citizenship of the child who is born here. By virtue of the 14th Amendment, and as confirmed by the Supreme Court in Wong Kim Ark, a person born in the United States is a citizen of the United States, even if they are born from undocumented alien parents. Which means that, contrary to what many people are saying in the media, this is settled law. And legally, President Trump cannot do anything to change that law on his own. Now that being said, President Trump has never been intimidated by the fact that the law is clear and unambiguous to try to do something that is contrary to the law. And so it is still quite possible that President Trump will issue an executive order purporting to end birthright citizenship as we know it. But even if that were to happen, this is one subject where a President Biden could easily change and clarify the situation by rescinding that executive order. The same is not true for many of the steps that the Trump administration has taken in the area of immigration law. And the complication for a President Biden will be in understanding the entire breadth of the executive action that Biden will have to address in order to undo all of the damage that Donald Trump has already done to U.S. immigration law. Thank you for watching. Please remember to like and subscribe. If there are any topics you would like me to address in the future, please let me know in the comments below. Now, I don't like talking about this, but I am currently disabled because of complications following cancer surgery. If you're feeling generous, I'll have a link to my PayPal account in the description below. Thank you.